Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So really quick summary of the last chapter. We were introduced to the runners. Bite, the albino Asian Decker. He also dabble in rigging. He's socially inept and double it down being the greatest asshole in Seattle. He loves his older brother along with hating him for being gifted at everything. Short Fuse, the dwarf shaman worshipper of Dionysus. He's poor as fuck, smells of cheap booze, wears worn out clothes and pretty nice guy. Always ready to help his community, one beer at a time. Dice, the elf infiltrator. She's a teenager assassin. Named Pepper and looking like the Pepper Pots from Iron Man. Armored adventure. Built like not. Batman. On a mission to kill her mentor and other targets. There's no backing out for her since before leaving her master poisoned her. And she's on a timer to kill him and get the antidote. She estimates less than a year. With luck perhaps more. Wolfhound. The street Sammy. The orcish equivalent of Wolverine with rocket feet. Got a grudge against Apex and his gang the wild dogs, and he's ironically afraid of dogs. He's a badass that can't easily be taken down, and if he tells you he'll get your job done in 30 minutes, expect it complete and less than that. We'll start up at their new fixer, Hogue, the troll mom leader of the Baron's commune before they take their first job. Chapter 2, Dollhouse to Madhouse. It was early in the morning. Less than 8 hours has passed since the team managed to defeat a gang of bikers, saved a troll girl, escaped a horde of feral ghouls all the while within a building set to explode in less than 10 seconds. Considering the job was done in less than 30 minutes with no casualty on their side, it went pretty well for a first run. The team was nearly assembled. Dice was running late and Short Fuse was helping the community's soup kitchen for breakfast. Bite was sitting casually in the corner of the room playing games on his comlink. He hated being there. He despises being in a filthy place, and thanks to their mage and infiltrator he has to sit on this creaking chair longer than he had to. Meanwhile Wolfhound was cleaning his metallic claws, having nothing better to do. He does it every morning and every night since he chunks of people he tear apart tends to get stuck on those. It'd be bad if he became sick because of it. Hope was enjoying soup along with a besed calf before anyone else. Privilege of being the commune's leader, and needing it after the night she had. Sariamalatids mephistimiaking up the silly. That was Dice their infiltrator. Usually she prowls at night, searching for clues on her targets and kicking asses, then takes the morning off. Being a runner with responsibilities and engagements towards a team was something new for her. While Wolfhound just glanced in her direction, Bite was about to comment on how elves can't be on time with the grass they have for brains. He never got the chance to say it though, since Short Fuse opened the door loudly, and stepped into the room, jolly like a small hobo Santa Claus. Hope put down her spoon, drank one last cup of besed calf and decided to begin the meeting. Hope, I'm glad you all made it. I can't tell you how happy I am that you have all accepted to be my team last night. I have a job for you. But before that I'd like that we discuss a bit. Hope, before we go any further, I want to know more about you guys. A bit about your past, what you like, your goals in life, the kind of things. Bite, exasperated, why do you think I insisted on only giving you my street name? I'm not interested in sharing that kind of info with anyone. Sorry miss, but you can stuff your cheap team building exercise in you. Hope, listen here. Snowflake. Being a fixer isn't about having my ass stuck to a chair, calling people with my comlink and expecting Johnsons to magically ask for my services. This whole business is about trust, professionalism, and respect. Clients trust me to send what I have best, and I need to know I can trust you. Now, if you don't keep your tongue in check, I'll do it for you, trog style. Bite for the first time in his life shut his mouth. It is one thing to insult people anonymously on the matrix, it's another to be in person with an out of patience troll. Bite, with a sullen attitude, fi i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i
I ain't much to show. Could have been a corper, but my parents fucked up before I was born. Now I want to get rich and stop drinking Basidkaf in a crappy apartment that belongs to my oh so wonderful brother. What I like. Luxury. What I dislike. Poverty and filth. So pretty much everything in a kilometer radius right now. My goal? Get rich. You want to trust me? Trust that I want millions. All I can get. Quickly. Hope. Cracking a smile. You see. Not so difficult now isn't it? I believe you know how to drive pretty well too, no? I'm assuming since you asked for mods for the Ars Roadmaster here. Bite and Return only gave her a disdainful sigh, clearly annoyed with their fixer. She ignored it and turned to Wolfhound. What about you big guy? You didn't talk much last night. I guarantee it would be beneficial if you talk a bit more with your team. I'm grateful you rescued my daughter so fast, but being this hasty might have put her in great danger. Thanks a lot, Omei. Wolfhound took a long breath. He never liked being criticized, even less when the opposing party was right, but he figured he at least owed this to his new teammates. Wolfhound, I don't know much about my past. Or rather my birth. What I know is that I got rescued by a bunch of psychos, got beaten, tortured, made one of them, killed for them. They twisted me, ripped the meat from me and replaced it with... All that. When I had enough, I got out. I've been tracking and putting them down. Like the wild dogs they are. I like simple things, like cigars, beer, my gear and fighting. I hate one guy and every man that follows him. I intend to exterminate them. If any of you won't help me in my endeavor, I can quit the team right now. I won't burden you with it if you're not willing. I know how it feels like being tasked with something like this. The office was in complete silence. Seeing the orc who turned hard boiled bikers into chunky salsa without batting an eye, being this intense with his hatred, chilled the room a few degrees. The small light coming through the windows seemed like a child's night light compared to the red glow of his sibaris. Bite, pretty metal, dude. If what you want implies fucking up someone's day, I'm in. Dice. You can count on me. Those punks will pay for what they did to you. Short fuse, if those guys are who I think they are, the streets will be safer with them six feet under. Count on me. Hope smiled when the team were already getting behind Wolfhound's goal. Her team was already shaping up into something great. Hope turned towards Dice with a curious expression. She remembered the teenager elf said something about having a goal of her own. She looked at her for a brief moment, expecting the energetic infiltrator to tell everything by herself. An awkward silence followed instead. Dice, realizing it is her turn to speak, oh yeah. It's my turn now. Um, I'm pretty much like Wolfhound here. I got people to kill too. What was an awkward silence before doubled in intensity? To have the cheering youngster telling everyone she was on her way to commit murder tends to kill the mood. Some would say it was to be expected with the way she turned a guy into minced meat just to look good. Mind you the adventure was just starting for us. Short fuse, hoping for a clearer explanation, a car eye. But why? You're clearly too young to have that kind of grudge against those people. Unless they killed your parents or something. Dice, nah, never knew my parents. Born and raised on the streets. It's just if I don't kill those people in less than a year I'll die. Wolfhound, you're full of dreck. Dice, what? No. I'm telling the truth. Bite, you totally stole that from a shitty Tridia. Looking how old you are, I bet it's only and bodyguard. Two, you could have done better kid. Try and be original. Dice, first off, it's not shitty. It's a masterpiece. Uni made me cry when she had to undertake her father's duty. Second I'm not full of it. I'll literally die if I don't get an antidote in like 10 months from now. I'm as good as dead. Perhaps even sooner. Wolfhound might want to geek those punks for revenge. But for me it's survival. Hope, I suppose there is no antidote for your predicament? Dice. Well if you got an antidote for the recently developed prototype of poison that flows in my veins. Please tell me. Wolfhound, guess we can't help it. Okay kiddo, count on us for your problem. Short fuse, 
I'll do what I can to help you Pepper. Bite. Just so you know, I'm against having a teammate that would drop dead in the middle of a run. Boo do it I guess if everyone's fine with it. Just remember you guys, if a mission goes south because of it, it's your fragging fault. Short fuse, we heard you loud and clear, stop whining. Well boss, you already know about me, but I'll try to keep it short and simple for you chummers. I've been homeless since I was a kid, I like to drink a lot, I do magic. I have a Greek god for a mentor and I want to help this commune. Also, anyone who harms a child earns my instant and unrestrained wrath. Anything important I missed Hope? Hope, with a tint of worried starting to form. Nope. Short fuse. Good. Can you tell me what our run is now? I doubt Bite can tolerate being here a minute longer. Bite answered with a fake smile and a completely dishonest thank you, while Hope took a short pause. She was visibly anxious towards what she was about to say. Hope, well I have a run ready for you. And I know short fuse your talents would be best suited to be the group's face, but I think you should let someone else do it. Short fuse, wah. Hope, you could let dice try. I know that bite can't hold a conversation for shit, and wolfhound ain't the talkative kin. Short fuse, give us the run. Hope, we'll judge after. Hope, with anguished. Your client is the owner of a Bunraku parlor, named the Dollhouse. For those who don't know, a Bunraku parlor is a brothel where most of the girls were kidnapped, fitted with cyberwares and cosmetics, slotted with chips that erases their personality and then are passed around as meat puppets to have fun with. There's hardly any person living who doesn't find the idea revulsing, and most of those establishments are under the protection of the accusers. Short fuse. Well I do find it distasteful that our first official run starts with that, you could've find better. What's the deal with me though? Hope, well the guy running it is a nut job. Like real insanity. You. Won't like how he runs his polla. Short fuse, then why not let someone else pick up the run? We could settle with something else. Hope, I'm new in the business. Well not really new, but the one I learned the trade with is long gone. Most of my old contacts are either buried or locked up, and you're my only team right now. I said it earlier, it's about trust. Now we got a new team, with a new fixer. We have to prove ourselves even if it means doing things we hate. Okay short fuse. Short fuse, undeterred, what time? Hope, it's at 11.30. You'll find the place in Touristville. The Bunraku parlor was standing in front of them. The outside aesthetic looked like a real dollhouse. Minus the walls painted black, and the neon lights installed everywhere. On Tridia on top of the entrance was a half-naked chromed up girl, dancing to some repetitive beats. The more you look at it, the more sickening it gets. The time was 11.25, but they didn't felt like waiting outside, so they decided to enter. Inside wasn't any better. The building was dimly lighted, Really loud electro music playing, with the vibrations from the basses could be felt into your very bones. Girls, some more chromed up than others, were walking around serving men or doing private dances. Those who were not sporting the latest wares were covering themselves with latex suits. One of the girls went to welcome them. Her hair was white like snow. It was hard to guess if it was natural or it had been replaced like most of her meat. She spoke with the energy of a machine running low on power. Welcome to the dollhouse darlings. Are you here for a drink? A private dance? Or something more? Intimate? Everyone on the team except Wolfhound was in pure discomfort. In his case he just didn't care. Short fuse, we're here to meet the owner. Mr. Johnson. The woman blinked once, then twice, as if not registering what the runners just said. Then she pulled out a data jack and connected it to her port. A bright second passed and she then faced the shadowiners, a warm smile across her face. Well my darlings I did not expect you this soon. Come. I'll fetch us a table. It was surreal. She did not change personality like they were half expecting when she pulled out her data jack, but it was like she received a boost of vigor instead. They walked through a dance floor. Dodging the cold touch of the robotic woman dancing like if they had strings attached to each limbs. The very scene felt alien to them. 
Short fuse could feel in the air that the astral in this place was corrupted. I'm like, so glad you came darlings. I've got this issue that I need to be fixed. Short fuse, taking the lead despite Hope's warning, and what would be your problem? Can't believe it's protection if you're with the Yaks, MR. MRS Johnson? MR, S, Johnson, haha, <laughs> call me whatever you want beautiful, and no, I'm not under the Yakuxa's protection. They know better than to place their greasy pawns into my business. My problem is that and there's a business in the other side of town. I want you to snuff the light out of the whole bar. Kill the manager. Butcher the bouncers and employees. Maim the clients even. I want that place permanently close. Short fuse. Slightly worried, isn't that a bit too extreme? He's not even a direct competitor if he's not in Touristville, no? M.R. S. Johnson, my reasons are my own. I pay you for a job, runner. Short fuse, then I suppose you know the price for wet work like this? M.R. S. Johnson, I'm offering you 10k New Yen Sugabud. It's already too much for a bunch pretty green runners. Short fuse. You're asking us to hurt innocent bystanders. That'll cost extra. Raise it to 15k. MR. S. Johnson. I'd rather have a cleaner number if you're about to divide it by 4. Beautiful. I'm giving you 12k, and it's final. He would have hoped for a higher number, but insulting a MR Johnson was a surefire way of making your group unpopular. He wasn't about to blow their reputation at their first run. Begrudgingly he was about to shake hand with his employer when he heard a shriek, loud enough to pierce the music that was playing. Bite. What was that? Wolfhound. Sounds like a girl. M.R. S. Johnson. Why yes darlings, I do believe it is one of our new girls. Surely she's being introduced to what she'll need to work here. Dice. Her face suddenly pale grasping her super headphones. That was not just a girl. That was a kid. M.R. S. Johnson. We get all sort of people wanting to work here. Some were just not ready for what it entails. Pure unfiltered rage was coursing through Short Few's face. He was about to jump on their client, reputation be damned. Dice was unsure what to do, but she felt like joining her dwarf friend in his righteous fury. Bite was preparing to duck under the table, regretting ever waking up this morning. It was Wolfhound that defused the situation. He was sitting between dice and short fuse, and under the table he slightly let out his wolveny claws, touching the ribs of both their mage and infiltrator. With their killing machine about to turn against them, short fuse calmed his murderous intents and promised himself to quench his bloodthirst as soon as the run was over. N.R. S. Johnson. I'm glad this little incident didn't deter you from your job, beautiful. Don't worry, I won't hold this against you, it's perfectly natural. Though I do better. In the unnatural. Johnson glanced at the girls on the dance floor and the own serving drinks, looking them move like if they had strings attached, he seemed like an artist proud of his work. N.R. S. Johnson. You'll find the place easy beautiful. It's downtown and under renovation. I believe they're almost done. You'll see some turned off neons with carnal desires written near the entrance. Now go my darlings. Get this job done quickly and I may change my mind about your payment. The team exited the Bunraku Apollo. On their way out, some of the chromed up women caressed them with their cold metallic hands. Some called them darlings, or beautifuls and were inviting them to join on the fun. All with the same energy as their Johnson before she jacked herself up. The team went back to the commune in complete silence. Dice and Short Fuse felt betrayed by Wolfhound threatening them to stay quiet. The Sammy and Decker in their case felt that their infiltrator, and their mage, should have picked another career than Shadowrunning if they cannot support working for human thrash like the owner of the dollhouse. While they entered their van, the shaman exploded in rage. Short Fuse, why did you stop me? Wolfhound, think with your grey matter. Short fuse. We know nothing about that place and what security they have. Did you have a plan back then? Or were you intending on running gun blazing into the free? Being told the very same words he said to Wolfhound the previous day woke him up from his anger. 
the dwarf took time to think what was the best course of action he could take at the time, and had to admit he barely knew what could have happened. Yet he still couldn't let go. Short fuse, you expect me to simply kill people, for that. Monster? Bite, we expect you to do the job you agreed to. Wolfhound, truth be told I couldn't give less of a dreck about the mission. We have a reputation to uphold if we want to get better jobs. We can't just jeek our employer like that. Dice, what do you expect us to do then? Wolfhound lit up a cigar, smoked for a while, then looked at his team with a grin. Wolfhound, not sure about you chummers, but I fancy myself a drink. The ride towards the carnal desires went well, though the runners were mildly miffed that taking the Vandalade the mods the garagists were installing. When they arrived, it was night time. The building in front of them was quite pleasant to look at, even more when compared to the dollhouse. Even under renovation, Carnal Desires was shining with recomforting lights with music that won't bleed your ears. The door was locked. While most runners would have found an alternate entrance, the street Sam simply knocked at the door. A troll bouncer answered, annoyed. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NickBedia for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Bar's not open yet. Now piss off and come back tomorrow. Short fuse. Well, we came here for business. Would you call your boss? Bouncer. More annoyed. Don't care what you want. Get out. Short fuse. But. The bouncer. Pissed off. Look shorty. This place will be open to public tomorrow. Tonight's VIP only. Ain't seen you on tread before. And you don't even look like you could afford a drink here. So why don't you and your little friends just get out beefo. Wolfhound. I can't believe you haven't seen me on screen before. You know I'm from that famous show. Where they rebuild your house in its entirety. If I had to be honest though, I've mostly helped when they tear down walls at the beginning. Wolfhound was seeing that the bouncer wouldn't let them pass under any circumstances, so he decided he was about to pound the security troll to get inside. Worst case scenario, two bars will be wrecked tonight. You think you're the hottest wreck around, pal? I can break you in two, and that's not counting on my pals inside. Wolfhound, just throw the first punch, bitch. The bouncer swung his fist as strong as he could. Wolfhound barely got the time to block the blow with his raised up arms. The runners could swear they felt a shockwave. Hell even the concrete beneath the Sammy's feet has caved in. The jacket on the troll has started tearing off, revealing high grade silverwares. Wolfhound expected the blow to be hard, troll strength and all, but he thought that with his titanium skeleton he could handle it. He was partly wrong. While not enough to actually hurt him, he will surely feel the pain next morning. Grinning through the shock, Wolfhound Sibri shined their red lights, and he said, Was that your best? Try again when there's ten of you, you. He hit the bouncer straight on the nose with a right hook, stupid punk. The troll flew a few meters inside the bar. When the runners stepped in, the music had stopped and the patrons were looking at them with fright. Then the silence was cut shut by a man's voice. It's alright everyone. They're part of the guests. Our bouncer must have insulted their bodyguard. It was the owner of the bar. A man in his late 30s, wearing the type suit along with some arse shades. He had perfectly clean white teeth, and if he seemed anxious about what happened to his employee, he wasn't showing it. While two other guards took off the troll to provide him medical aid, the owner of the joint invited the runners to take a seat and discuss. I was listening to your conversation with Frank. I hope what you said with demolition was a jest. Wolfhound. Well, 
It's a half truth. To be honest, we were given the task to demolish the place. Kill you and the men working for you, and possibly maim everyone here. If what the Sammy said put the owner under pressure, he wasn't showing it. He only sipped from his cognac and readjusted his R shades. Well, I'm glad that you are being honest with me. Not every day we see some honest psychos. Wolfhound, well, that's our mission, and as Shadron as we are bound to see our task through, otherwise it will hurt our rep. That's understandable. If you'd like, I can keep a booth for you and wait until everyone's out. I'd rather have the opening night of my place go without a hitch. Wolfhound, we're not dumb. You'll just call the cops on us when it's closing time. But I got an offer for you. You want me to pay you more than Psycho Slaver, and in exchange you forget your hit on me? Wolfhound, his name's Psycho Slaver? Well that makes it even easier, and you got it wrong. We want you to hire us to take him out permanently. The owner of Carnal Desires now was baffled. Everyone who had a connections with the underworld knows of Psycho Slaver. His deals with the Yaks for Chrome in exchange for services made him untouchable. And now there are Runner S knocking at his door proposing to take care of the guy who ordered him dead. I'm be pretty happy if you kill that bastard. But how much are you asking for, MR? Oh right I should introduce myself first, I'm Damien Brennan. Wolfhound, name's Wolfhound. Short Fuse, I'm Short Fuse, pleased to meet you. Dice, you can call me Dice. Bite, just call me Bite. Wolfhound, and what we're asking for, is 12001 millions. Damien, only 12k? And why the 1 million? Short fuse, we need a higher pay to be motivated. Bite, plus screw that guy. Can't wait to see that maniac's face when we tell him we turned on him for 1 million. Wolfhound, but before that we'd like to know why is it that psycho slaver got you on his shit list. Bite, and everything you know on the guy when you're on it. Damien couldn't believe his luck. With glee he told the runners everything he knew about Psycho Slaver, along with free drinks on the house. He told them how he used to work under him, that the girls are actually chipped 24 stroke 7 with personifix of Psycho Slaver, that the bouncers that worked here used to be slaves at the dollhouse, and how he took his former boss's money to finance this establishment. Dice, so you're saying those girls are also resort girls? Damien, yep. Psycho trust no one but himself for security, she he chromed them with what's best on the market. Dice, but if he uses the girl during fight. No, we have to find a way to pass through them. I don't want to hurt the innocents. Bite, you heard what he said, Dice. Those girls ain't got a personality no more. They're just metally and fleshy puppets at this point. Consider it a service putting them out of their misery. Dice, no. Bite, you're a pain in the ass, brat. Dice, I don't care. Wolfhound, it's not impossible to deal with them without killing. Damien, you got a clue on what kind of wares they have? Damien, I keep tabs. Can't tell what Psycho's new fancy, or if he has hidden some tricks of his own inside them, but I mostly know what they have in general. Wolfhound, any of them got an air tank? For the second time in less than 24 hours. The runners went to the Bunraku parlor known as the dollhouse. The same kind of music as earlier that day was playing loud enough to have the walls vibrate, with the same girl on Trillia above the entrance moving like a puppet with strings attached. Dice went inside first, with Bite guiding her via her headphones. She was entrusted with taking out as many resort gerals as she could, but first she had to gather them. She went to the first one on her way and made her demand. Dice, Bite. Hey, I'd like to request you for an intimate dance. In fact, I'd like to have you and all the dancers you can get. The living doll gave a weak smile and answered with the same low energy as before. Oh my, beautiful. Some are already with clients right now, but I'll see if we can get me, you and two to three more G. Dice, bite, did I stutter? I said all the girls. Private room, fresh and ready, right now. The hostess was unsure for a few seconds, as if not processing what she should do in this situation. She pulled a data jack from herself and was about to plug it into a port, but Dice placed her hand above hers. 
She then whispered what Bite was telling her in the doll's ear. I got a huge payday. Today. I want to party and get freaky. If you catch my drift. She then pulled out a empty platinum cred stick that Damien lended them for this hit. The hostess considered the cred stick for a brief instant then she seemed to gain a flicker of life for a second. She then asked the uncomfortable infiltrator to follow her. They went through the whole dance floor, near the dining tables and finally the private rooms, picking up all the resorgerals to the protests of the clients, and went into a large and isolated room. Red of embarrassment, Dice swore that she would murder Bite if his plan doesn't work. Meanwhile, the other runners were set into position. They knew they didn't have much time before Psycho Slaver reclaims his property. Wolfhound walked towards the bar. There was only one left remaining, the bartender. It was the white-haired doll from Irula. Her cold eyes were unresponsive even when angry clients were vehemently complaining in front of her about their dates ditching them. She was clearly not listening at all, since her data jack was connected to her port hidden beneath the counter. Wolfhound gave one last glance to his team before giving the signal. Short Fuse was stationed near Dice's room. Having no subtlety he was waiting for the fighting to start before barricading their infiltrator with two dozens murderous cyborg hookers. Bite found a nice table to hide under, along with some chairs to block the line of sight under it. Grinning with what he told Dice to say, he plugged into one of the dollhouse's hidden port, jacked into the matrix in VR and was ready to have the fight of his life. With everyone ready, Wolfhound headed straight to the bar. His mask in place, he could hear everything around, and with the music's volume it hurt it a lot. He then adjusted the sound filter, focusing it in its entirety to the bartender who was now unplugged. She was heading straight to Dice's room, claws extending from her fingernails. The Sammy's Sibiris was glowing red in anticipation as he stepped in front of her. Wolfhound, I'm afraid I can't let you do that, psycho. So you know about me, darling? She said with a cleary fake innocent pout. Despite not completing your task already, I'm gracious enough to give you more time, beautiful. Now move, I have a business to tend to and your friend, who's a minor by the way, is ruining it. Feeling the inevitable clash between the Razorboy and the Razorgeral, the patron started fleeing the scene. Now, there was only the runners, and the white-haired chromed-up doll. Wolfhound, you won't have to worry about taking care of your business after today. By that I mean you won't have one to work with, that is. Now's the time. The lady cyborg jumped at Wolfhound, claws out for the kill. She moved with grace and speed unseen before by the runners. The Sammy barely got the time to unleash his wolverine claws and block, but the Resorgeral contortioned her body to be atop her opponent. Short Fuse put up a physical barrier blocking the only exit to Dice's room. He hoped his elven friend will be able to handle the murderous dolls before they tear off the doors. While many men on earth would sell their soul and mother to be able to spend the night with over 20 prostitutes, Dice would give anything to be out of the spot she was. Hanging on the ceiling with the help of her gecko grips, she was getting increasingly worried she could not make it. Hearing the fighting outside, the Sibirdals deployed their hidden weapons. Claws, blades and guns were all out and looking for a victim. Before any of them had the time to make a step dice threw a pepper punch grenade on the floor and put up a mask. For those who don, Tino, pepper punch gas is like pepper spray, except it's at best 10 times more painful and hurts everywhere. It's the perfect cheap tool to knock out dangerous opponents without harming them. Much. With his arms raised defensively, Wolfhound was blocking as best as he could a volley of slashes the Resort General was hitting him with. Still sitting on top of him with her legs locked around his neck, she delivered blow after blow, slowly breaching his defense. Trying to not hurt her that much, he decided to charge a wall head first, hoping to slam her against it. Unfortunately she dodged at the last second, not without running her claws through the street Sam's unprotected back. While their muscle was dealing with the girl, Short Fuse maintained the barrier, but he knew Wolfhound wouldn't last against the white-haired doll with his non-violent approach. Still maintaining the physical barrier, he walked away from Dice's room and began preparing for a second spell. Meanwhile in cyberspace, Bite was facing one powerful opponent. It was a grand and beautiful angel made of 1s and 0s, 
with a sophist ace best around his waist. On the best was attached 21 chains, all linked to individual copies of the Resorgerals. One chain in particular glowed bright while the others were semi-transparent. Byte assumed that the belt is some kind of master control, with Psycho Slaver piloting the bartender as his main drone, while the others were in automatic. Using the element of surprises, Byte summoned dozens of floating moors and sent them to devour the chain links. Psycho Slaver, do you really think you have enough power to free them? Some of the Matrix dolls began chasing after Byte's floating jaws. While they destroyed his programs, the Decca noticed that the links in some of the chains seemed like they were faltering, then they disappeared. Either using his dolls directly in the Matrix made him lose control of them in meat space, or his attacks were finally hitting where it hurts. Dice was barely hanging on the ceiling. She was safe from the gas grenade thanks to her gas mask mod on her mask, but some of the girls were still in good shape. While they began to realize they cannot escape and the pepper punch was taking them out, they began attacking the infiltrator, to no avail. Dice would have breezed through it if it weren't for some of the resorgerals climbing the walls with their cyber weapons, coming towards her. Byte was beginning to lose the fight in cyberspace. He tried sending as many jaws as he could to devour the chains, but to his surprise free the girls from Psycho Slaver helped him focus his avatar. He was shooting beams of binary stronger by the second end. Opting for a second solution, Byte sent all of his floating moors to devour the belt around Psycho's waist. While being half devoured alive, the enemy Decker seemed to be panicking. He raised a hand towards Byte, with a furious tone in his voice. What are you doing you idiot? If you break the console I'll lose my dolls forever. Byte, and why would I care asshole? If it's destroyed you won't be able to save any of them. It's the only way to turn them back. Byte knew the guy was lying through his teeth, and would have happily deleted the belt, but he knew deep inside him that if he did his team would have never forgiven him. Mustering all his strengths and dodging lasers made of 1s and 0s, Byte jumped at Psycho Slaver's avatar and grabbed the belt with both hands. What do you even expect to accomplish? The impossible, dickhead. Using all his willpower to tank through Psycho Slaver's attacks, Byte forced himself into the system deeper than he has ever tried before. Then with a roar of victory, he yanked the belt from the other decker and put it around his own waist. How? It can't be. How do you even manage to do that? Byte, because fuck you, that's how. Loosing all the control he had over his dolls, Psycho Slaver jacked himself off the Matrix, suffering dump shock. Meanwhile Byte was exhilarated with the victory he just gained. Dice was on the verge of being dropped from the ceiling into a pile of murderous cybernetic hookers when suddenly they all jolted in unison, and then fell to the group at the same time. She decided in the end to not hold a grudge against their decker for the lines he made her say in order to get the resorginals isolated. Wolfhound was sitting near the bar, drinking an entire bottle of expensive alcohol. Bleeding from his back, it hurted like hell and he hoped the booze would help dull it a little. Meanwhile Short Fuse was sustaining two spells at the same time. The first being the physical barrier he placed to have the girls locked in, and the second was a levitation spell to neutralize the white-haired Resorgeral. She nearly managed to defeat their stronger fighter, but in his defense he wouldn't fight back. While in the Matrix, Byte decided to look at the controlling device he just took possession. Like he suspected, nothing of the original girls remained. Their personalities have been erased, gone forever. Looking for alternative solutions, he noticed something. The personifics attached to each girl have been tampered to last, and to host Psycho Slaver's personality. With this new control panel, he could assign them new identities. The only issue is that while he grafted them some trays, the host needed to model itself after a person. Seeing a useful program that came with the belt, the Decker, with a malicious grin, sent to can you connect your data jack, Wolfhound? To their Sammy, and waited patiently. Receiving the message, the street Sam rose up and connected himself into a port. Wolfhound, what's the matter bite? Why do you want me to hear ar 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 It was as if his brain was a book and someone was reading and flickering the pages at the speed of light. Hundreds of thousands of pictures were flashing in less of a second in an incomprehensive cyclone of information that nearly managed to split his mind apart. 
Wolfhound raised his hand almost reflexively to unplug itself from this madness. Each millimeter was a long agony. Each instant felt like an eternity. Just as he was about to pull the plug, he heard Bite's voice telling him to wait. If he could he would have told him to eat Drek, and to fuck himself with a sharp object, but the pain was too much to act against the Decker. Soon after, a delightful sensation went through the Sammy's spine as the upload was finally completed. When he opened his Sibiris, he was being surrounded by short fuse and dice. Then his Kumlink activated itself and Bite's voice came out of it. Bite, hey, Chama. I got some good news for you and bad news for us. Wolfhound, what's the bad news? Bite, bad news is I'm stuck for now. Seems like the place I am is like a virtual computer or something. Think of it like a world inside another world. I took control of the inner world, but Psycho is holding me in inside the outer world. Short fuse, can't you just jack out? Bite, I think I can, but I'm not sure I want to do it. It'll be painful, plus worst case scenario and I'll be taking double the dump shock. Dice, what do you suggest we do? Bite, you could kill the bastard? It's a start. Wolfhound, we'll see what we can do. Now what's the good news? Bite, well, you're a big brother now. The three runners in meat space were in complete shock, while Bite was laughing like if he was possessed. Wolfhound, in the name of everything that is sacred, you better explain it fast Bite before I kick your limp body in the nuts with all my might. Bite, whoa whoa whoa. Don't get too excited big guy. The girls have no personality anymore. So instead of leaving them to their fate, I gave them a new shot at life. Wolfhound, get to the point. Bite, their mods are kinda unique. If you don't want them to be a 100% real dolls you had to give them a new identity. Problem is they had to have a default setting based on a real person. I thought it'd be a little bit too disgusting if it was me they were model after, so I took it upon myself to choose you as their model. Wolfhound, and why is it that they are now my new sisters? Bite, well, even if they have a leader among the group, they will always obey imitate the prime model. Didn't have the time to rework an entire program on the fly. Instead I decided to change some few line of codes, and in place of being their original, you are now their older brother figure. Wolfhound, please tell me there's not 21 girl me that I now have to take account for. Bite, well you were the original canvas, but I took some artistic liberties. Dice, like what? Bite. I took some personality traits that I enjoyed from my favorite characters in fictions and added them to each of the girls based on what would suit them best. Trust me, I only had their best interest at heart. Wolfhound, please, tell me you did not make your ideal harem of wafers with my identity. Bite. Holy Drek, I'm losing my connection. I'm like being attacked. Save me from Psycho Slaver, I'm about to die. He he help. The Kumlink call ended. The shaman and the infiltrator dared not to look their friend in the eyes. The street Sam was feeling cold hatred towards their decker. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Wolfhound was about to yell profanities at their decker but it would be of no use. He also considered kicking his unconscious body in the bulls a few times, but now wasn't the time for petty vengeances. The three runners looked around the Bunraku parlor silently. It was too awkward to say anything after what Bite has done to Wolfhound. At first they checked behind the bar, and then in the kitchen, even the private rooms but there were no clues where to find Psycho Slaver. Short Fuse was considering summoning a spirit to help find the missing enemy, but then Dice had a bright idea. Her headphones have recorded the entire conversation with their Johnson, including the chilling kid scream they have heard. 
With the select sound filter and audio enhancements she was able to pinpoint the shriek came from under the stage. At the center of the dance floor, near where the pole is placed, was a control panel to decide what kind of ambience the room could be. Among its features were space funk, techno vibin and action, passion, along with custom light modes and a song lists. Having no clue how to use the device to open up their way, Wolfhound though about using his claws to open up a passageway, but Dice explained that this way could trigger traps. Short Fuse added that it could damage his cyberspace. Against his better judgment, he called Bite, who at first refused to answer, believing hiding who save him from their angry Sammy. What followed was a long conversation between a furious Razorboy and a shifty Decker trying to weasel out of whatever his infuriated comrade had in reserve for whenever he jacked out. After being assured that Wolfhound won't punish him, and he made him swore to God, his saints and his own mother, Bite guided the group on how to open up the trapdoor. They walked down a long flight of stairs, with short fuse nearly sliding and taking out Wolfhound with him. Apparently some sadist used soap or oil on every step as a trap. Nearly falling to his death, Short Fuse tried to stand up while yelling insults towards Psycho Slaver, to all stairs in existence and to his shitty luck in general. He then used a healing spell at high force to repair what has been broken. Luckily for him, he was good at soaking the drain of his magic. Down the stairway and in front of the group was a single room. On the left was a young teenage girl on an operation table, visibly chromed with some of the latest wares on the market. She appeared to be unconscious and connected to cables. On the right was a man in the an isolated pod, plugged to many life support devices, along with a huge cyber deck. He was a frail Asian male, tattooed and jacked to his machine. At first glance, it looked like Psycho Slaver used to be a member of the Accusus. It would explain the wares on his employees at least. With prudence, Dice looked up at the medical record of the enemy and scanned him with a biomonitor on her mask. She concluded that the main was deathly allergic to pollution and had a poor immunity system. Along with his weak muscles, if he was left outside the parlor he wouldn't make it past the day. Wolfhound was able to ask what they should do with the man when he received a call on his comlink. It was Psycho Slaver. PC must admit, you've done a number on me. I've nearly lost everything and most likely I'm about to die. Wolfhound, pretty much, you sick fuck. Release the girl in the room, and I'll make it quick. Short Fuse made a face that clearly tells he wasn't happy with that, but he wasn't about to say it out loud. Peace seem sorry Wolfhound. I'm afraid I cannot do that. Dice, why is that? P.S. I've just begun to make her comfortable for me. Along with the wares, she is now my second chance at life. Short Fuse, unable to contain his anger any longer, what do you mean comfortable? P.S. By that I mean erasing her personality. Only her core remains. Unfortunately it takes more time than anything else, but on the good side, even my death, or being unjacked won't stop the processus. It is too late. I'll live again. Wolfhound, and what would stop us from snapping both your necks? P.S. I know for a fact you wouldn't do this. Otherwise you wouldn't bother trying to save my dolls. The Sammy didn't know what to reply. He couldn't figure out a way to interrupt the dollification without their decker. It was the same for the infiltrator. She didn't have any gadget that could save the day. It wasn't the case for Short Fuse. He had a plan, and all it took was a phone call and dabble into some really dark magic. Short Fuse made a call to Damien Brennan. After a few minutes of negotiations, they finally came to an agreement. Then the shaman turned towards the weak man with a cruel grin on his face. He raised up his hand, and his mind touched with the one of Psycho Slaver. Short Fuse, hope you'll like being in the shoes of one of your dolls. Psycho Slaver was nearly done breaking the last barrier surrounding his victim's mind, when he felt disgust at what he was doing. In fact, he felt disgust towards everything he has done and towards himself. He felt the need to stop his operation, and to free the girl from his grasp. Unfortunately, he couldn't repair what he has done to the girl's psyche, and for that he knew he had to suffer for it. It was strange feelings he had right now. Almost unnatural, but those were definitely his ideas. Then he made a call to some shady lawyers. 
He knew instinctively he was about to die in the next minutes, so he had to change his will and corrupt some officials before it is too late. His building and all of his belongings would go to Damien Brennan. He didn't why he wanted to give all of this to the man who betrayed him, but he felt it was the right thing to do. Then he felt that his time in the world was near its end, but he had to pay for what he has done. He must die, slowly and painfully. Otherwise he wouldn't feel right about it, despite his instincts and logic screaming at him that he mustn't do that. He felt a war was waging inside his head, but his heart was winning over. After all, what's life preservation and cold intellect against a just soul? For the first time in months Psycho Slaver jacked out of the Matrix. He felt disoriented and sickened at being in the meat world, but he still had a mission to do. His hand rose up, shakingly and with difficulty, then with all the strength he could muster he pulled out every single cable connecting his to his life support devices. It is when Psycho Slaver felt satisfaction at his own imminent demise that he felt his mind splitting apart, like if he was one entity that now became two. The enemy Decker's face was filled with horror when he realized what he had done, or rather what the dwarf forced him to do. Coughing and suffocating, he gave one last look at the shaman. His eyes were glowing gold, almost like two molten balls of magma. On his forehead was protruding two ghostly ram horns, shining with a purple energy. Behind the mage, behind the runners. Unbeknownst to them, was also a man wearing some kind of purple robe with the same horns and the same translucidity as short fuse. The apparition gave Psycho Slaver a warm smile, raised a glass of wine and drank while slowly disappearing. It was the last thing he had seen before passing away. So after dealing with Psycho Slaver and scarring dice for life, the runners cleaned up the Bunraku parlor and waited for Damien and his men to come and bring the girls back to the Baron's commune. At first they wanted the owner of the carnal desires to take care of them, but they didn't have the resource to take care of 21 resorgerals and a teenage cyborg. It was decided that the ladies would be offered up a place inside the community, and afterward they could decide what to do with their newfound life and freedom. They also received a cred stick with 12000 nullions, along with a call from their half angry half overjoyed fixer. I meant 12001 nullions. Wolfhound picked up the call on his comlink, apprehensively. Sure he did a great thing getting rid of Psycho Slaver, but he was still originally their client and Hope was surely about to call concerning this. Hope, you know Wolfhound, it hurts a runner's rep when they turn on their clients. The same goes for their fixer. Wolfhound, I know Hope, boo. Hope, when I said it is a relationship built around trust, it's because I trust you to get the job done. Bite. Annoyed, you clearly are not going to say we did a bad thing, are you? Hope, nope. Screw that guy. My point is that trust goes both way. I should have been informed about you turning on your client and proposing an offer to Damien Brennan. It is my job. It could have went horribly for you, especially since it's your first run. The runners realize with a bit of shame that their fixer was an T really angry at them, but disappointed and worried for their safety. Even Bite felt a really small, tiny bit of regret. Short fuse, by the way, how are you aware of what we've done? Hope, your new client is pretty thorough. He checked who you guys belong to, called me, and we negotiated. You guys are lucky to have this guy as your first Johnson. Short fuse, wait, you renegotiated? I just made a deal before. Don't tell me you made it null. Hope, do not worry, he's still on board with your idea. In fact, he loves it. Let's just say that his new reopening will need some bodyguards, since his last bouncer is recovering, and he just found himself an eager team of runners ready to pay a debt. Bite, don't tell me we're going to work for free. Hope, meals and drinks are on the house. Bite, Suadu, when's the job? People were pretty surprised when Carnal Desires made a grand new reopening three days after it just opened. Rumor said that the owner received a generous donation in exchange for changing the theme of the establishment. For the occasion, the team went to go shopping for fancy suits, since they didn't gave a good first impression last time they went there, Q fashion montage. Bite bought clothing that displays in our jaws munching wildlife, or just grinning and laughing menacingly at whoever was looking at them. 
Wolfhound bought a black and gold armored suit to signify his role as a street samurai, along with same solid shades over his sibaris. Dice in her case bought an armored dress, but customized with to display superhero comics. As time went on she grew to like the comparison to Batman more and more. Short Fuse just rent a nice gray suit with cufflinks shaped like grape vines. He wasn't inclined to buy clothes he wouldn't wear every day. Pick related is what the restaurant was redesigned into. Damien Brennan was occupied during those last three days. He had been renovating the entire building from the top est ceiling to the lowest floor. After the deal he made with the dwarf shaman, he was more than likely to accept his proposition, even more with all the newlands provided by his dear friend Psycho Slaver. With all that money he was even able to finish all of the 10 floors. It is with glee that he opened the door of his new club, the Temple of Dionysus. Surprisingly like the runner said, there were a lot more clients that came compared to the first opening. It was as if anyone who's somewhat important were required to show themselves here that very night, otherwise it would be as if they have missed the most important thing in the world. Every kind of minor to major celebrities, politicians and corpus was invited that day. All 10 dance floors were filled to the brim. It was so natural. Damien remembered when he was a rich corper who went to Dante's Inferno at minimum every weekend. He was living his life wildly and without care. That is until he was fired from Raz. He was charged with embezzlement. Of course he did that, but the funds he stole wasn't the ones he was accused of stealing. Life was never the same without the high he got from Dante's Inferno. Meals tasted bland, the alcohol felt like cheap booze and it was everything seemed so ugly. That was when he was reached the bottom that he had the idea that if he cannot party at Dante's, he will make his own. Unfortunately, when trying to learn the business he was tricked by Psycho, and was nearly turned into an obedient slave. He couldn't remember how he escaped with his friends, but whatever happened, he was grateful for this opportunity. After spending some years gathering enough funds to buy and renovate the building that he is now, he thought he was on a good start, but with the help of his new pals the Shadowrunners, his plans have been rocketed forward at least 5 to 10 years. Short Fuse was relaxing inside one of the many VIP rooms. He didn't feel like mingling with the other guests, after all he's just a poor as fuck dude while the other people invited have 5 digit suits. He picked up a bottle of expansive wine, and with content drank most of it in one got. He would have wasted himself like that all night if it weren't for someone uninvited entering his room. The stranger was a man with tanned skin and long black hair, his eyes radiated strength like two golden suns, and he was oozing magical power. It was intoxicating, but in a good way. Short Fuse drooled a bit of the wine he had in his mouth. He couldn't believe who was in front of him. The stranger opened his mouth first, a mischievous grin on his face. I have to say, Nikos, you surprised me today. Short Fuse, wait. What the? You can't be. Well, yeah? The stranger's smile grew even more, as if he knew every word that the dwarf was about to say and enjoyed giving the answer he already planned for. Is that so? Is it so impossible for a god to show himself to his followers? Short fuse, well, no. But. You're a spirit mentor. You represent an aspect of ourselves, or magic. Or something, no? The man standing in front of Nikos Galanis was none other than Dionysus himself. The shaman couldn't close his mouth, he was so surprised. He never knew it was possible for his spirit mentor to manifest himself, but at the same time, at the core of his very being, he knew it to be true. Dionysus just took some of the wine and drank it up. Trust me Nikos, if it was that easy to understand the true nature of a god like me, anyone would be one by now. But let's not discuss such things right now. I have some important things to tell you. But before that, more wine, and perhaps a meal. Dionysus pressed a button on the table, calling a waiter to the VIP room. The man was costumed to represent a satyr in our VR, but the dwarf could almost swear that the waiter was a real life satyr. While exchanging pleasantires as if he had always known the man, the Greek god then ordered more alcohol and some filet mignon. When the steaks arrived, he got smiled with envy, but before taking a bite he tossed some of the meat to a fireplace in the room. 
Short Fuse was about to ask why, but his mentor answered before he even opened his mouth. Dionysus, sacrifice to the gods, mortals used to give us so many long ago. Now there's barely any iffy rings. Everything is given to neon, metallic and concrete tyrants, with men and dragons sitting atop of them. Short Fuse dare not to say anything. He was entirely absorbed by every word his spirit mentor was telling him. Dionysus, even if it was long before your birth, magic has barely returned to this world. There were many opportunists that seized the opportunity, but unfortunately for us we couldn't manifest ourselves. Which brings me to what you have done today. He took a bite from the filet mignon, with a halfway satisfied smile and muttered I can't beat Ambrosia. Then his expression became serious. Dionysus, I won't take my time to say it, Nikos. What you have done today is phenomenal for me. Without placing a single stone, you built a temple for me. I gave my blessing to the owner of this restaurant and made him one of my believers. You have done so much for me, yet I will ask for more. Short fuse, whatever your demands may be, I'll do my best. The god displayed a proud smile, overjoyed by his followers answer. Dionysus, this is why you are one of my favorite servants. Your generous soul can shine brighter than a star. He drank a bottle of wine whole, closed his eyes in pleasure, then opened them again and looked directly at Nikos, his iris is shining like two suns. Dionysus, I need you to spread my cult. Go build more temples, amass followers and spread my name. I need you to help me incarnate into this world fully, Nikos. The dwarf was amazed by what he just heard. His mentor spirit, his god, has given him a divine quest. Dionysus, oh right, before I forget, don't think you act won't be rewarded. I have two gifts for you. Well, the second is more of a mutual opportunity for both of us, but still I hope you will appreciate it. Dionysus presented his hands to the shaman. He then first opened and up his left palm. It was a grapevine with some fruits hanging off of it, but it was also radiating magical energy. Dionysus, attach this vine around your arm and you will be able to summon a spirit to help you in time of needs. Nikos Galanis didn't waste any time placing the gift around his left arm. Today was definitely a great day for him. Dionysus, showing a USB key, and this in my other palm is some intel. I have heard about an old beer factory neighboring your commune. It is filled by criminals for now, but someday soon, you may want to claim it for your people. This is the bidgin in on how to do it. If you claim it in my name, I will grant you another boon. Short Fuse didn't know what to do with the small device, but he pocketed it and thanked his protector. They drank some more, partying like if it was their last night on earth, and not long after everything went dark for the shaman. Meanwhile, the other three runners were each dealing with their own kind of fun that night. Bite was trying to flirt with women, only to end up getting slapped in the face and trying his luck with another one, while Dice and Wolfhound watched from a safe distance. If nothing else, their decker was a source of entertainment. Seeing that the infiltrator wasn't having as much fun as she would have been normally, the street ask inquired about what was on her mind. Wolfhound, Bite got rejected by over a dozen actresses and you're still moping around? We just won the day, relax a little. Dice, I can't really. Each day that passes is closer and closer to my death. How can I even relax? Wolfhound, ain't it the same for everyone in this room? Dice, you know damn well what I mean. Wolfhound, I think not. Look at them. Each of them, including me and you, will someday die. So unless your master waltz in here in his underwear, antidote in hand, I guarantee your situation wouldn't be any better than it would be tomorrow, or the day after, or the da. Dice, I get it. Doesn't help me much, though. Wolfhound, sure is. Since we would be doing runs with our awesome infiltrator in not that long, we'll need her in top shape. Physically and mentally. Dice. I'm not sure I won. Wolfhound, tell you what, bet you 100 I can drink you under the table. Dice, easy for you to say, I'm not old enough to drink. Wolfhound, well you're fake sin say you're 21. Dice, you don't mean. Wolfhound, 
My lips are sealed. The morning after the group woke up inside the commune. In a room that Hope lended to her runners. It was a pretty nice place considering they were in the barrens. The first to wake up was Wolfhound, who made some beset calf and started reading some magazines. A lot has changed in his life this week. He has found a new team to work with. Each had their own quirks. But in an odd way he could trust them with his life. He also, thanks to their dick of a decabite, 21 new sisters, along with another younger one, B, wasn't sure how to deal with this. The girls have been invited to stay within the commune, and they have been quite the celebrities around the barons. They have made their own gang, called the Iron Maidens and have been defending the commune from outsiders. Well defending is a big word, only a few of them knew how to use their chrome. The rest just gather up and look intimidating. Hope was considering hiring him to teach them, but truth was Wolfhound didn't have the skills to teach someone else how to use cyber weapons. As a matter of fact he was looking for a master himself. Hope told him about a crazy one that lived in the barrens decades ago, but no one has heard of him in years. That will be something to add on his to-do list, along with tracking and eliminating Apex and the wild dogs. Bite was the next one to wake up. He felt like shit, and felt like he almost slept in some. When he realized he slept in the poor part of town, he headed straight to take a shower. If he wasn't in a foul mood already, he then began to curse his out loud when the only running water was cold. Dice opened her eyes, her head hurting as if it was splitting apart. She swore she was never touching alcohol again after this. She went to get dressed in her gear, then headed for the soup kitchen. She met Short Fuse working there. One would believe partying with the actual god of festivities would leave you shit faced like no one else, but he was feeling extremely fine. They all met up afterward at Hope's office, with Bite swearing revenge on any imaginary being who had him sleep in a hobo's nest. Hope sipped a bit of her besed calf, one of the only joy she could afford those days, and started briefing her team on their next run. Hope, well guys. I got some good news and bad news. Wolfhound, looking at Bite, ain't that something new I've never heard before. Bite, shut up Wolfhound, someday you'll be grateful for what I've done. Hope, well, we're grateful for the Iron Maidens. They have been quite popular. With you and them, people around here have begun to remember something they have forgotten long ago. Hope, Bite, how ironic. Hope, ha ha ha, now you shut up Bite. Let the grown ups talks. That remark was followed by a smirk from Dice, which was put to an end with Bite stomping one of her feet. Hope, good news is Damien has spread some rumors about you, and it has become easier to find jobs for you guys. I have one ready just now. Dice, that's awesome. Sure Fuse, our career is starting well, but what about with the bad news? Hope, I bet you have forgotten the month's almost over. In like 3 days you'll have to pay rent. So you have less than that to complete the run and pay your tenants. Unless you want to join my peeps on the street. Bite. Don't even joke about it, I'd rather get shot than that. Hope, well I'm glad to see you're eager to work. The Johnson wants to meet you at Mama's Finest. Short Fuse, a family restaurant? Ain't really professional, no? Bite. That or he doesn't take us seriously. Short Fuse. He could be a regular Joe trying to hire us? Dice. Perhaps he was just hungry for mama's finest? The other three runners let out a sigh and prepared to meet their new client. Here's the conclusion of the second chapter. Next one to follow is the revenge of the cat lady. Thank you neckbuds for reading. I do not know when I'll upload chapter 3, but if the thread is still up tomorrow I'll add a list of the 21 girls along with their new persona lights and anything unique about them. For 8 hours I have slumbered, and now that I have awakened I will give you the promised list of Wolfhound's new sisters. Lily Hunt, human, she is the white-haired resort general at the street Sam dueled inside the Polar. She is one of the most proficient in her group at using her cyberwares. She is the de facto leader of the Iron Maidens, due to her assertive personality, her skills and ability to handle any situation happening to her family. She likes the color white since it represents purity, something she considers herself not to be, and because it is the color of her hair. One of the last natural thing about her body. Ever since she has learned about what her first name means, 
She has begun planting and taking care of lilies. Her favorite choice of clothing are plain simple robes. Lara Hunt, Orc, among the sisters, she would be the eldest, in her early 20s. Unfortunately most of the girls didn't have any records, so the runners could only estimate her age, plus as a natural orc she ages faster than anyone. She can turn her hands into guns, she's probably taller than you and can probably bench press more than you can ever lift. As the tough gal, her favorite color is crimson, actually lightish pink, her favorite hobby is fighting, nope it's ballet, and she usually wears jacket, she'd like to try some dresses, but she thinks it won't go well with her silverwares. Sarah Hunt, human, of all the sisters she would be the smartest. If you don't find her defending the commune, your best luck would be to find one of her favorite hiding spot. Reading a book. She is curious and aspire to learn everything that she can. She wishes to be able to visit museums and art galleries around the world, read books from the most famous libraries and to teach what she has learned to a student of her own. Her favorite color is cobble blue, and even if she doesn't need it with her sibberies, she likes to wear glasses to look smarter and more mature. Jessica Hunt, human, always cheerful, Jessica is the type to always crack a joke, even in the most dire situation. Some are pretty good, while most are simply punts. Dad joked hair. You can often find her around the commune playing pranks on unsuspecting denizens. Though she more than make up for it in protecting everyone. She's quick, she's strong, and got hidden katanas inside her arms that can dice a man up before he even lifts his weapon. Her favorite color is bright yellow and she likes to paint and customize her silverwares. I think the GM took inspiration from Yang of Rabbi. Alice Hunt, elf, of all the resorgerals, she is the one who looks the least modified. Or rather, most of her mods are biowares. She's got platelet factories, symbiotes and tailored pheromones and other wares and gears that helps healing and seduce. The group guessed she was made for other customers. With her new personality she is horrified by violence, which can be overcome when with her sisters, and aspire to learn medicine and help everyone she can. She has claws that can come out of her fingernails, but she's not proficient with them. Her favorite things are pastries, her family and detective novels. She's also very fond of the color royal blue and of hoodies. Nancy Hunt, dwarf. Nancy would be the closest to a metahuman computer as anyone can be. She's got a cyberdeck implanted in her and she runs the comms and matrix for the Iron Maidens. She also helps with the matrix in the Baron's commune from time to time. She also has a grenade launcher into one of her cyber arms, but with her lacking the skills to use it, she never carries any ammo. She doesn't like anything in particular, except calm and serenity. Her favorite color is forest green and you will often find her with a bandana on her head. Maya Hunt, human, she is very reserved, barely speaks and likes to be alone the most. Is what people assume, while in reality she is just extremely shy. Only with her sisters or wolfhound she becomes a little bit social. She has metallic claws that comes out of her fingernails, but unfortunately she is not proficient with them. However she excels at sneaking around. She is kind of a goth girl and her favorite hobbies are poems haikus, spying and sightseeing at night. Her favorite type of clothing are gothic lolita dresses with cute accessories and her favorite color is black. Linda Hunt, orc, often having to be the one to put an end to disputes when Lily isn't there, Linda likes to believe she is the most mature of a group. If you happen to cause trouble, her cyber shotgun to the face would calm your nerves in an instant. She's the type of girl that always wear a pair of jeans, along with a simple t-shirt. Her favorite color is gray and she finds sheeps cute. Stacy Hunt, elf, among her sisters, Stacy is to be the prettiest. If she isn't patrolling the commune with her sisters, she is in her room taking care of her body. She is a fan of fashion and if she had the new yen, she would spend them all in luxurious clothing. She aspired to one day become a celebrity, especially a famous actress. Every day she practices in front of a mirror. She likes anything pink or cyan, in particular scarves. Diane Hunt, orc, she has been heavily modified to look like a perfect human girl, so much that there's barely anything orcish about her, except for her muscles. Equipped with shock hands, 
she can deliver quite a punch to any who threatens her family or the commune. Knowing she cannot ever regain the meat that she had lost, and the appearance of her previous life, she yearns for a better life, a better self. She envisions that someday when she'll get the new yearns, she'll go to the operation table and become a new person. She likes art and beauty, and despises criminal organizations for what they've done to her. Marie Jane Hunt, human, she's a fighter. She likes to beat up dudes, sometimes with other dudes. Her cyber arms can lift a car and throw manhole like they were frisbees. She once tore a guy apart that way. Her passions are wrestling, urban brawl and action movies. Her favorite color is crimson red and you'll never see her without a leather jacket. Elizabeth Hunt, orc, like her brother Wolfhound, she too possesses wolverine-like claws along with her titanium skeleton, though she also has high quality dermal plating. Often she wonders what her life would have been before being found out by the runners, or being turned into a doll. As the brawn of the Iron Maidens, she makes sure she is in the front line and being always able to protect her sisters. Her favorite color is silver and she favors clothing that show up her silverware. Delilah Hunt, human, of all the girls, she might be the only one enjoying being chromed to the maximum. With her cyber machine gun she mows down waves of feral ghouls like turkeys. She's also a weapon enthusiast, collectioning every gun and every blade from her enemies. She take care of everyone's cyberware, cleaning them and repairing when the needs arise. Her favorite things in life is collecting gear, she's quite of a nerd about it, cookies and raiding enemy gangs. She usually wears red and deep blue clothes, but sometimes she switch for white and red. Rosa Hunt, human, she was rebuilt for flexibility and agility. She can do backflips while slashing a guy from behind with the claws like it was nothing. Her passion is dancing and wishes the whole world could see her talent. However, she has a tendency to be kind of a klutz while not dancing or fighting, to the horror of anyone in her vicinity inside the commune. She usually wears indigo dresses. Jane Hunt, human, full of childlike joy, Jane is the type of girl that spends most of her time either gaming or watching Tridius. That is when she's not doing her duty along with her sisters. Despite having a hidden pistol in one of her arms, she prefer to leave the fighting to her siblings while she watches from the rear. She likes to wear a schoolgirl uniform, colored red and black. She is also modeled after Earth Chan. Jade Hunt, human, she is a young girl with a passion for traveling, learning and meeting new people. She believes anyone can become a friend, if you work hard enough to gain its trust. Armed with her cyber heavy pistol she is not afraid of bad encounters. Her favorite color is khaki green and she likes to wear cloak, to look mysterious. Natasha Hunt, human, this girl could feel magic ever since she woke up in her second life. Unfortunately with all the essence she lost because of the wares, she is almost completely burned out of it. She is most of the time depressed because she lost something she could have, and never had any choice in the matter. When she is not moping, she helps her sisters, or try to make herself useful. There's not a lot of things that she likes. Only thing that cheers her up is music, most of the time plugged in VR so she could be separated from the astral. She likes to wear dark grey clothes, along some bandages to hide the cyberwares. Kate Hunt, human, there are a few words that can describe that girl perfectly. Like shameless, stubborn and shifty. Rarely would you not find her gambling the little millions she gains, or stealing back her losses, or making completely stupid wages. After losing all her cash in one go, her right to use her cyber blade was taken away, her opponents were cheaters, but that nobody told her. Her ambition is to someday own a casino. Nobody thinks it's a good idea, but well, it's the best she's got. She likes the color gold, and she wears usually clothes she won at cards. Cynthia and Cindy Hunt, elves, having the same appearance, with the same cyberwares and no extensive surgery to change one's looks, Byte assumed those two were twins and gave them nearly the same personalities. Both of the resorginals have twin claws on each hand, like Laura. Wolverine's daughter, and are always in sync, from their movements to the way they speak. They love to make themselves impossible to distinguish, or to plug their data jack together and hold long secret conversations. They often help Jessica in pulling her pranks, 
and ditch her at the last second when they are about to get caught. When they are casual, they often wear dresses. Cynthia wears a royal blue one, and Cindy an orange one. Or is it the other way around? Dot. Ariana. Ork. She is well mannered, helps everyone all the time and never complains. If she is not sweeping the floor on some of the apartment buildings, she can be found at the commune soup kitchen helping with the meals, or even preparing the said calf for Hope and her children. A generous soul, she is also kind of a work alcoholic. If she's not doing a task or giving someone assistance, she feels like she's a waste of space. That people would abandon her. Every pastel color is her favorite. When she is not doing any work, which is rare, she usually wear a simple pastel blue tunic, with braids in her her blonde hair of the same color. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.